Well, ladies and gentlemen, I should like to welcome you to the sixth in our second series of book discussions on recent works on the history and culture of the Jews of the Polish lands, organized under the auspices of the Global Educational Outreach Program of the Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews. Tonight's discussion is an evaluation of a pioneering work um, uh, it could lead to dancing, mixed sex dancing and Jewish modernity, which was published by Stanford in 2021 and is written by one of the participants in tonight's discussion, Sonia Gollins. It's an investigation of how mixed sex dancing has functioned as a flexible metaphor for the concerns of Jewish communities in the face of the impact of social change. Dancers and balls certainly appear throughout world literature as places for young people to meet, flirt and form relationships. And the popularity of such events transcends class, gender and ethnic boundaries. In the context of the 19th and 20th century Jewish history, such events offer crucial insights into debates about emancipation and acculturation. While traditional Jewish law clearly prohibits men and women from dancing together, among those who advocated the accommodation of the Jews to what they saw as progress, Jewish mixed sex dancing was understood as the very essence of modernity. By its opponents, it was seen as the ultimate boundary transgression. Writers of modern Jewish literature, above all in Yiddish, German, Hebrew and English, from the late 18th to the mid 20th century, deployed dance scenes as a charged and complex arena for understanding the limits of acculturation, the dangers of ethnic mixing and the implications of shifting gender norms and marriage patterns. In her book, Sonia Gollins examines the specific literary qualities of such interactions, while also paying close attention to the broader social implications of the Jewish engagement with dance. Combining cultural history with literary analysis and analyzing uh, contemporary representations of Jewish social dance, she illustrates how mixed sex dancing articulated the concerns of Jewish communities in the face of cultural transitions. This is a remarkable book. I can see it behind uh, uh, Sonia on her shelf there. And I'm very glad that we're able to have this discussion. I'll just describe the form of the discussion. I'll first ask Sonia to describe what she was trying to do in this book. And then I'll ask the two discussants, Naomi Seidman and Sunny Yudkov, to discuss the issues raised by the book. I'll introduce them after Sonia's presentation, but I should first start by introducing Sonia, who is recently arrived in London. I think that we live more or less in approximately a mile of each other, which seems quite strange given that we are engaged in this form of communication which spans the continents rather than such narrow uh, distances. Uh, she's now a lecturer in Yiddish at University College London. She's a scholar of Yiddish studies and German Jewish literature, an interesting interaction, and her work focuses on dance, theater, and gender. Her first book, uh, It Could Lead to Dancing, Mixed Sex Dancing and Jewish Modernity, is of course the subject of tonight's discussion. Previously, she taught at the University of Vienna, Ohio State University, and the University of Göttingen. I did summer courses at both of these two universities, so I know what interesting places they are. She received her PhD in Germanic languages and literatures from the University of Pennsylvania and her BA in comparative literature and Germanic studies from the University of Chicago. And I'm happy to hand the floor over to Sonia. Thanks for the introduction, Anthony. And I'm going to share my screen now. A young man who is engaged to be married, goes to his rabbi to learn about marital intimacy. Red-faced with embarrassment, he listens as the rabbi tells him how to properly perform the mitzvah, the religious commandment of sexual intercourse with his wife. Finally, the rabbi asks the young man if he has any questions. Stammering, the young man asks if it is permissible to perform the mitzvah with the man on top. Certainly, my son, the rabbi reassures him. This is a classic way of fulfilling the mitzvah. The young man relaxes slightly and, 
although still blushes, continues with a second question. What about with the woman on top? Again, the rabbi reassures him, also perfectly acceptable. Some people even prefer it. May you be fruitful and multiply. The young man relaxes even more and begins to get more creative. He suggests several, a different, uh, several additional variations, and the rabbi enthusiastically approves of each one. Finally, with scarcely a trace of embarrassment, the young man asks if the mitzvah can be performed standing up. Absolutely not, the rabbi bellows. It could lead to mixed dancing. <laughs> When I told people I was writing a book about mixed sex dancing in modern Jewish culture, they frequently recalled this classic joke. My book focus, focuses primarily on dance scenes in Yiddish and German literary texts from the 19th and early 20th centuries. During this period, dance was everywhere. In rural taverns in Poland, dancing academies in Nuremberg, elite balls in London, and dance halls on the Lower East Side of New York. I also found that there was a lot of anxiety about different types of boundary crossing on the dance floor, including dances between men and women, between Jews and Christians, and between people of different classes or educational backgrounds. I use the term mixed sex dancing in my book because I focus specifically on concerns about men and women partnering together on the dance floor. And I use sex instead of gender because a lot of these concerns ultimately relate to the physical bodies of the dancers instead of whether they identify as male or female. Dances appear throughout literature as places for young people to meet, flirt, and form relationships as any reader of Romeo and Juliet, War and Peace, or pride and prejudice can confirm. Dance scenes are a way for writers to criticize societal expectations about courtship while simultaneously entertaining their readers. My book demonstrates that dance is a powerful tool for narrating Jewish social inclusion and exclusion. And now we have what I consider a Jewish version of this image. Dance scenes help Characters negotiate religious, class, and national boundaries in a transgressive fashion, since the dance floor is a space where individuals can meet and form relationships with dance partners who are not regarded as acceptable marriage partners. Dance scenes are particularly important in literary texts from the 19th and early 20th centuries, which discuss how Jews tried to integrate into European society. Scholars use a variety of different words to talk about the process by which Jews participated in the cultures of their neighbors. These terms include assimilation, acculturation, and dissimulation. I mostly use the term acculturation because it means engaging with another culture, but not necessarily giving up on your own culture entirely. Dance plays an important role about Jewish acculturation, especially since Jewish law prohibits men and women from dancing together. Literary depictions of Jewish mixed sex dancing demonstrate the sheer variety of perspectives on Jewish emancipation and ideas about Jewish modernity and show how these concerns are related to ideas about Jewish bodies. It Could Lead to Dancing is the first book to focus on European Jewish social dance. It analyzes literary and cultural representations of mixed sex dancing, focusing on spaces such as the tavern, ballroom, wedding, and dance hall. My book shows how the specific literary qualities of dance scenes, such as the way that dance aids in plot and character development. Like, for instance, the scene in Fiddler on the Roof, where Perchik and Huddle fall in love while dancing. I also identify parallels between dance figures and plot structures. So, for instance, a book with a circular dance might also have a sense of repetition or coming full circle at the end. I also pay close attention to the broader social repercussions 
of Jewish dance. While contemporary popular culture often portrays Jewish mixed sex dancing as absolutely forbidden in an orthodox context, or as the punchline of the dirty joke that I used at the beginning of this presentation, dance provided 19th and early 20th century writers with a powerful metaphor for Jewish modernity that could be utilized in many ways. Writers use dance scenes to showcase their protagonists, explorations of their social boundaries and sexual possibilities. Dance gives expression to unruly desires in a deceptively permissive space. Yet when the dancing stops, the dominant social structures remain enforced and characters who do not adapt their passions often suffer tragic consequences. Dance is crucial in Yiddish and German Jewish literature because it conveys the temptations of non-Jewish culture across gender and class lines, revealing the way that Jewish modernity was often a story of Jewish participation in mixed sex leisure activities. Between the late 18th and early 20th centuries, a shift appears to have taken place in attitudes towards the prohibition on mixed sex dancing. Jewish participation in transgressive dancing was not a new phenomenon. Rabbis had been prohibiting mixed sex dancing and Jewish communities had been finding ways around the restrictions for centuries. Yet while earlier Jewish writings on the topic tended to emphasize the threat of sexual impropriety within a Jewish communal context, so things like adultery, starting around 1780, there was a greater concern, particularly in literary fiction, with the relationship between improper dancing and the violation of religious or class boundaries. In short, improper dancing was understood to reveal the influence of values from outside the traditional community, and such behavior demanded a fitting response. Modernity offered Jews new social possibilities outside of their religious communities. And these options for social mobility were quite literally embodied on the dance floor. Dance became an important metaphor for the process of acculturation in literary texts, coinciding with three historical phenomena. Greater Jewish integration in non-Jewish society, the evolving concept of companionate marriage, the love matches, and the increased popularity of intimate partner dances across class, about across different social classes. Dances such as the waltz involved extensive physical contact and provided more opportunities for dance partners to individualize their interactions on the dance floor rather than relying on the directives of a dance master. In the period following the Enlightenment, Religious communities were forever changed by the growth of secularism, and Jewish communities in particular grappled with acculturation, religious reform, and political emancipation. Even within a Jewish communal context, interpretations of Jewish law did not necessarily carry the same force as in previous generations. And it was necessary for authorities to appeal to such communal concerns as Jewish continuity, anti-Semitism, the family, and bourgeois propriety. Writers of Jewish popular fiction, whether they were religiously inclined or staunchly secular, portrayed mixed sex dancing as a threat to the social order. However, not all mixed sex dancing was equally subject to criticism. Dances in bourgeois German Jewish social clubs, or among Yiddish speaking immigrants on New York's Lower East Side, as pictured here, may have just seemed like new popular fun. Although these types of dances represented a new form of courtship, one which fostered love matches rather than arranged marriages, they did not necessarily challenge the composition of the matches themselves, since participants in these social events were generally in the same class educational or religious group. The true controversy occurred in life and certainly in literature when individuals danced with, flirted with, and maybe even married 
those whom their families and communities would not have considered an appropriate match. As such, literary depictions of mixed sex dancing typically involve multiple forms of social mixing. They concern dance partners of different genders, but also involve transgressions of religious, class, or ethnic boundaries. It is no coincidence that such anxiety about mixed sex dancing coincided with the period of Jewish acculturation and emancipation, so period of civil right, of debates about civil rights for Jews, since social dancing was arguably the most popular and intimate mixed sex leisure activity. It was moreover an important way for young people to display their obedience to the rules of fashion and etiquette while seeking out a marriage partner. Mixed sex dancing was, in short, a key way for both sexes in different ways to show their commitment to modern social norms and to display this commitment within the context of courtship. The stakes were, therefore, potentially quite high for the community, the family, and the individual him or herself. Writers often negotiated the thorny process of Jewish cultural engagement by putting Jews on the dance floor and describing what happens when they encounter an unsuitable dance partner. Yet the tales of these Jewish dancers often end tragically precisely because authors could not envision a successful resolution for them. Jewish women were particularly vulnerable to ill-fated love affairs, since an advantageous marriage was their main form of social mobility in the literary imagination, if not necessarily in reality. The fatal mismatch between the utopian fantasy suggested by the dance floor and a society that was unprepared to deal with a controversial match meant that Jewish dancers could not find a proper place for themselves. As a result, the delights of the dance floor often led to tragic consequences. In literature, the dance floor is a microcosm of Jewish integration into broader society, whether in Europe or in the United States. Dance scenes convey the appeal of a mixed sex leisure pursuit in a seemingly permissive setting, yet also reveal the limited options for actual social mobility. Despite these overall patterns, individual scenes vary in terms of social context, type of dance, amount of description, and precise nature of engagement with non-Jewish culture. In literary plots, dance scenes embody the problems of modern Jews in a manner that was designed to appeal to readers. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this very clear and stimulating presentation. I think everybody in the audience will now realize why this book has attracted so much attention and why it is so interesting. We have two people to discuss it this evening. The first is Naomi Seidman, who is now the Chancellor Jackman Professor in the Arts at the University of Toronto. She was previously the Corrett Professor of Jewish Culture at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley and was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2016. She comes from an Orthodox Yiddish-speaking rabbinic family and is the daughter of Dr. Hillel Zeidman. I, I feel I must mention this, one of the leading Jewish journalists and a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto. She's a prolific author and many of her works deal with the subjects which we've looked at this evening. Among them, A Marriage Made in Heaven, The Sexual Politics of Hebrew and Yiddish, Faithful Renderings, Jewish Christian Difference and the Politics of Translation, The Marriage Plot or How Jews Fell in Love with Love and with Literature, which is the most relevant this evening. And finally, A Revolution in the Name of Tradition, Sarah Shanira and the Beis Yankov School System. The second discussion is the second discussant is Sunny Yudkov, who teaches in the Department of German, Nordic and Slavic Studies, as well as in the Moses Weinstein Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Wisconsin. Previously, she taught at the University of Chicago. Her research and teaching focus on Jewish literary production from the mid 19th to the 21st centuries. And she's the author of Tubercular Capital, Illness and the Condition of Modern Jewish Writing. And she's currently working on a monograph with the provisional title Against a Jewish Humor Toward a Theory of Yiddish Joy. Uh, 
Sonia started with a, a joke. I hope that joke will maybe appear in uh, uh, Sonia's uh, uh, presentation of the in discussion of this uh, topic. So let me now say uh, pose a number of questions to the two discussants. I'll ask them to speak first and then for Sonia to respond to their observations. And the first is a question which has already been aired in Sonia's presentation, but which I think we could look at again, which is when did mixed sex dancing become a significant feature of Jewish life? And I'll ask Naomi first to talk about this and then Sonia to respond. Naomi. Thing. Because the so this is this okay? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, it's good. Am I freezing? Uh oh. Oh, oh, okay. Um, sorry. So I, I'll keep my fingers crossed about my connection. I don't know what the problem is. No, it's but, good um, now. It's good now. I'll just say one of the things that's so interesting about this question, which is amply answered, and so. Okay, Sonia, Sonia answers this at length in her book. Um, it's view in Yiddish, German, it's, it, it, it's how this answer is generally given. So the timing is um, the, the beginnings of modern Jewish literature are also the beginnings of mixed dancing. There's no, there's no coincidence there. Um, it's part of the same broader phenomenon. And one of the things that's interesting to me that I would love to hear Sonia talk about is how there's a certain lag or a certain gap between when mixed dancing happens and when it appears in literature. Um, and I think that in some, at least in, in, in the Yiddish literature that I'm familiar with, um, these are people living more or less traditional lives, often married at a young age, who are writing European novels without having European literary experiences. In other words, and when you, you quote Mendel Michael Swarm as saying, how am I going to write a novel? I never went to a ball. Um, so this question of, of representation and reality is actually fairly complicated when it comes to uh, Jewish modernity and Jewish literary modernity. In other words, people hear about things and people read about things before they get to experience them, these things themselves. And I think there also might be a similar gap. I'd love to hear you talk about it, Sonia. There might be a similar gap between the kind of dancing you might be reading about and then the kind of dancing you might be experiencing. So I think there's a certain kind of um, delay in representation in the tavern scenes, for instance, because the idea is that great literature has to have balls not a bunch of drunk people, you know, dancing around in a tavern. So, so this this is something I don't quite know about, but I suspect that, given that Jews were sort of often isolated and knew about European culture through their reading habits, at least some Jews, and that reading habits were as aspirational as they were representational. I'd be very curious to hear whether, uh, Sonia, you came across other sorts of types of gaps. And I, I know this is mostly focused on literature, but where it is that the literature didn't exactly match the social reality. Well, before I ask Sonia to respond, I'll ask Sonia to give your views on this question of when did mixed dancing become a significant feature of Jewish life? Uh, sure. Um, uh, thinking along with Nomi's question and with with Sonia's book, um, I guess one could start just by saying, you know, the 1780s, right? Let's give ourselves a date um, for when mixed sensing, mixed sex dancing, just um, uh, becomes an active part of modern socialization. Um, but I, but I also thought what was so interesting, um, thinking along with Nomi's question and with Sonia's book, is that. The first chapter articulates how there never wasn't a time when there wasn't mixed dancing. So I, I know I had a lot of negative words in there, um, but you know there's Talmudic citations trying to proscribe mixed dancing, and there's moralizing tracks from the early modern period trying to proscribe once again um, mixed sex dancing. And I, and I'm wondering if maybe Sonia can also add into this conversation 
um, when we are moving, when, when if maybe if 1780s marks the shift, if I'm reading Sonia correctly, where we're talking about intimate partner coordinated dancing, um, as opposed to, I don't know. And here I would, I would ask for what, what is the, what is the opposed to, um, how does this differ from what the moralizing tracks are saying in the early modern period? How does it differ from the Talmudic citations? What marks this moment of mixed sex dancing, um, as this potentially explosive moment, um, which we'll talk about subsequently, right, of acculturation. Um, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. Well, I think that a number of important questions have been raised, so I'll ask uh, Sonia to respond. So um, thank you so much for this. Um, with Naomi's, um, you know, remarks, um, thinking particularly about how um, Mendel Lemoyer-Svargam Abramovich in his memoirs writes about how he um, he never he never danced a quadrille at a ball. Um, how much these um, the question of dancing is tied into concerns about the development or status of modern literature and the role of desire. Um, so much of what the the writers um, who were starting the process of canonizing Yiddish literature, including Mendela, were interested in creating a literature that was specifically Jewish. And so the question of where the dancing fit in and how it could fit in, um, and whether they could only imagine balls as being literary um, is something that I think would be very interesting for the two of us to think about um, in terms of the intersection of our interests. But um, um, I think it also shows how uh, the different these different types of dances are also reflecting some of the different social contexts in which dancing was done, and um, some of which, like dancing at balls, might be viewed as more high status. And then you had wedding dances, which were pretty ubiquitous through literature. But then, on the other hand, um, if you're dancing at taverns or in dance halls, that isn't given the same social cachet, but unlike weddings, where, for instance, in Shola Malachim Shtempenu, um, a wedding musician is at the center of this attempt to build, to write a Jewish romance. And there is some dancing there. There's one um, particularly wonderful scene where a man and a woman end up dancing um, a Kazatsky, um, mm -hmm. a Kozakok, um, the opposite of each other. And I'm not entirely sure how this really works. Um, when dancing in skirt in long skirts, but this is um, because this is the um, Ukrainian dance involving like kicking um, at a very low level. Um, so I'm not quite sure exactly how well that works with skirts, but there are I've found a number of instances in which women are described dancing in this way. Um, so dancing does appear in some of these texts that are that are trying to establish Jewish. Uh, a Jewish literature um, and define what it could be. Um, in terms of uh, what Sunny is saying, I, would, I mean, so yeah, thank you, Sunny, for for um, you know reminding us that this that dancing is this controversial topic for centuries, where the rabbis keep prohibiting it. Uh, but one of the um, one of the things that I found particularly interesting. It, and this is something that actually Naomi helped me think about um, when we were talking about it at an early stage, is that there's a shift in how people talk about the um, talk about this mixed sex dancing. And what, one thing that's particularly interesting is when rabbis get secular authorities involved to try and prohibit these dances. Um, and so there it's an issue where Jews are leaving their communities and engaging in dances. Um, either they're, they're going and dancing with Christians, they are going to masquerades. Um, there's an example in 1786 where Rabbi Yedid Yabail of Karlsruhe um, wrote to his local government to ask them to help him prohibit um, Jews from attending masquerades and balls. And he doesn't say, oh, this is something that is violating 
Jewish law and leading to sexual impropriety. Um, so they shouldn't do it in that way. And for that reason, um, in the way that a lot of um, historically, a lot of prohibitions um, have said, um, but he says they're bad citizens if they do this. Somebody who would violate their own religion is not somebody who would be, um, you know, really, really good in service of the state. And that which should be a matter of concern for you as well. Um, and you get and so there's uh, more of an intrusion of awareness, both of the threat of the outside world in terms of sh uh, changing the way that Jewish communities are functioning and how dance is this very tempting activity and that could be seducing um, people, often young people, away from traditional ways of being, um, but also some of the ways in which it's framed um, can be quite, quite modern, including in connection with state authority. No, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to say that obviously we'll continue to discuss this among ourselves, but I hope that we have a large audience out there and uh, I hope that that audience will also participate in the discussion. And the way to do that is through the chat facility. So pose any questions uh, that you want to the chat facility. And uh, I know that the technical support will also be monitoring this and feeding these questions to me. So we've looked at how mixed dancing merged within the Jewish world. And uh, it's interesting that it has a number of examples showed. Uh, people like Mendela thought about this in the abstract rather than in the concrete. But of course, once you have it in the abstract, then people obviously want to experience this when it takes place. So uh, I'll ask a question which you also dealt with uh, to a degree in your introduction, but I'll pose it firstly to Sunny, which is, wh how, when did uh, mixed dancing come to be seen, in the words of the book, as an important metaphor for acculturation, Sunny? Thanks, Anthony. Yeah, I think I think one of the um, most productive aspects of Sonia's work is that it gives us multiple paradigms for understanding these many dance scenes across German and Yiddish literature. And one of the ways that um, you do that, Sonia, so productively is you give us a number of phrases that like dance is an important metaphor of acculturation. The dance hall or the scene of dance becomes a fraught space, a liminal space, a contested space. And I think um, what each of these, these, um, uh, uh, these, you know, contextualizing categories helps us understand is that dance is always about power. Um, and the way that that power manifests conveys how systems of power are working societally. Um, and it's particularly effective when you have characters who are identified as Jewish dancing with characters who are identified as not Jewish. And these individual Jews and Christians stand in for Jewish society writ large and Christian society writ large. Um, and what you show is there is, an, there is a clear paradigm, especially in the German context, where when a Jewish man dances or potentially dances or is rejected by a non-Jewish woman, the Jewish man is presented as physically inept as opposed to the Jewish woman who is seductive and attractive and who may similarly be maligned, but she comes to stand in for the attractive Jewish woman over and against the um, enfeebled stereotyped Jewish man. And in the Yiddish context, um, those, those, those stereotypes um, um, can sometimes appear in reverse. That is to say, the Jewish man who dances with the non-Jewish woman in the tavern is, you know, um, a uh, for lack of a better word, a ruffian um, and very physically fit. Um, and he's sweaty and he's jumping and he has demonstrates physical prowess. Um, so in this act of transgression, he's also uh, pushing against right the stereotype of the enfeebled Jewish man, but not fulfilling the ideal goal of the Jewish student. Right? So it becomes this important metaphor of acculturation because it's highlighting the tensions of who are Jews said to be and how are they said to be allowed into, um, into society? I, I kept thinking of Jacob Katz, and like semi-neutral societies. You know, I had sort of, you know, how is emancipation? How is the dance scene working? How is it all coming together? Um, and I think my, my question thinking with this, um, with these paradigms that you offer that become so helpful in analyzing subsequent literary scenes is actually the way you open the book. Um, which is very compelling phrase, this book is about mobility. 
Um, and it makes us think about mobility as an embodied experience of movement. And it's one more metaphor of acculturation that I think your work is driving at, um, which is my rather long way of saying, um, I, I want you to I invite you to think more uh, out loud for us about this term mobility. Um, what work is it doing? Why did you start your book off with a, with a word that doesn't actually appear um, you know, subsequently as a key word? Um, and I, I'm, I'm wondering if you can walk us through it and we can learn from you. I'll come to Naomi subsequently, but maybe I'll get uh, Sonia to respond to that. Um, well, I mean, the, so thank you, first of all, those are, those were some really, um, those were really great ways of thinking through the book. Um, to be extremely literal, the reason why I start with mobility is because that was with my acknowledgements and, um, in the time between when I, I mean, I, I lived in multiple countries based on being fortunate enough to have research fellowships and being either fortunate or unfortunate enough to have contingent positions in three different countries um, in several years before I ended up in a more long-term position here in London. Um, so I was thinking a lot about mobility um, in that context. Um, and I was very, very fortunate that I had such a great uh, support network of people that were able to help me through this time that was quite precarious. Um, and very fortunate that I was able to access lots of wonderful archives. But thinking about dance and how it relates to mobility, there is several, there were several different ways that I thought about it. And the big one was about social mobility, that um, the people who were dancing often had aspirations um, of being part of the bourgeoisie, of being able to participate in urban life, in um, in European culture becoming American. And so the mobility is often social mobility and the social mobility is associated with going to dance classes and learning how to behave so that they could take on the kind of life they would like to have. Um, but also the mobility often deals with, um, with borders, with migration, um, either from, from small towns, from Stettlach into, um, into urban areas, also from Europe to United States, from Yiddish speaking areas of Europe to German speaking areas of Europe, um, or even further, uh, further west within Europe. Um, and so all these, these aspects come up and, and, and learning new styles of dance is often part of this process. Um, and then there's the mobility of the dancing itself, that the ways in which movement is choreographed also says a lot about social relationships, uh, about education, about the types of emotions that are expected by, from people um, and how they want to show refinement, how they want to um, interact with people and how they're, they're hoping to get to know somebody um, in the context of courtship in a way that's much more intimate than um, prior than would be otherwise possible prior to marriage. Oh, thank you, Naomi. Do you want? How do you want to respond? Or at least, could you say something on this question of how dance became an important metaphor for uh, acculturation? You've written about from uh, the emergence of the concept of love. How is dance related to this concept? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I actually had another set of thoughts, but maybe Please, I yes. So I, I was actually focusing on the first time you posed the question, you used the word flexible. And it reminded me um, of the beauty of Sonia's writing, that there's so much wordplay. And the word flexible is, on the one hand, it's part of the, um, the tenor of the metaphor, right? It's it's a flexible metaphor. It's used in different ways by writers, but also dancing is also a kind of embodiment of a flexible body. And despite the ways that, or along with all the ways that dance is used metaphorically um, by the writers and in Sonia's reading, there's so much concrete embodied action. I mean, there's so much specificity, so many specific types of dance and so much close attention to the movements of the body. And I was just trying to remember who it is that said that 
Um, you know, it's a surprise to scholars that Jews had bodies and not only heads. Mm -hmm. So it's not a surprise to Sonia. Um, and I guess one of the reasons, one of the ways of thinking about dance as a kind of flexible metaphor is both um, the ways I, I was thinking about dance, not only in relationship to mobility and social mobility and these kinds of mo maybe more abstract or social dynamics, but also the relationship between dance, mixed dancing and sexual intercourse, which is where we started, um, which is that it's so close. It's so similar. It's so it's but it can be done publicly. Right. It can be. Um, um, it, 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 it so. In other words, the ways in which um, dance is close to sexual intercourse is what explains a whole lot of things about why it's forbidden and who you're supposed to be dancing with, just be the same list of people you're supposed to be having sex with and marrying. But it's also not. So dance, in other words, the rules are a little different. So for instance, ideally, you're supposed to have one mate at a ball, you have multiple partners and that's okay. So all the ways in which the the dancing is like and unlike sexual intercourse, sex, turn out to be such fruitful ways for, for, for writers to play kind of both sides of that. Um, and if I have another minute, maybe I can say a little something that I think responds to uh, when Anthony was directing at me uh, yeah. in particular, which is that I have a chapter in my book, um, The Marriage Plot, called The Choreography of Courtship, um, in which I try to make a certain kind of point that I think is something that you're also talking about, which is that um, modernity is sometimes described as a kind of letting go of all the religious rules. So a kind of freedom. So Jews kind of graduate from a, a, a you know, a rule bound society into a society where they can choose their own mate. Um, and one of the things that I think you do so well, Sonia, is to demonstrate how modern society combines this kind of freedom of the body, of desire, of choice, of sexuality, and pretty dramatic and specific rules of engagement, including not only these are the rules of how to waltz which nobody knows anymore or very few people know anymore. So you got to do some work in your book, but also these are the rules of waltzing if you're a woman versus if you're a man. Um, so this is really the moment in which not only companionate ma marriage, but also a kind of um, division of labor between the sexes, gender complementarity, I think is the word that a lot of people use that women and men should not be doing the same thing, which is why it's so interesting to hear about women doing the Kazatska. And women did the Kazatska in, or girls, because you really got to be strong and young to do it. Um, girls did the Kazatska in the environments in which I grew up, and they hiked up their skirts mm. um, and did it in the women's section. So what, you know, where gender complementarity is strong is actually in European society. And there are certain freedoms that might be found, let's say, in the circle dance, which is why we go back to the circle dance, I think, in Zionist society. But I, I think I'm already infringing on Anthony's next question. So No, I'll no, but this is that. very helpful. I, I'll abuse the prerogative of the chair to add something to what you've said, which is, Jews were very prominent in popular music in Poland between the two world wars for a whole series of reasons which uh, I don't need to go into here. But of course, popular music is closely related to dance. And among the popular music, which was particularly popular in interwar Poland, was the tango. And tango milonga is composed by Jerzy Petroborski, a well-known Jewish composer. So I, I wonder where, and the, the tango is clearly of all these dancers, perhaps the most obviously sexual. So that's that's uh, Tango Milonga, yes. Uh, so I in wonder- Warsaw. If, so, in Warsaw, very good, yes. Well, uh, so could you comment both on what uh, Naomi said and also say a little bit about the tango and why Jews were so attracted to the tango? Or where the tango, for, tango is also pro, a dance about movement and immigration. It developed in Argentina among uh, mostly, I suppose, Italian immigrants. Thank you. 
Um, I, I, so I actually, I found some example, some references to, um, to tangos in literature, but not as, as many as um, some other, uh, some of the other dances um, that I discuss. Although there is this great, um, there, there's this great discussion of tango in interwar um, Warsaw, late interwar Warsaw in, um, it's Rebecca Goldstein's book, Mazel, which is from the 1990s, um, an American Jewish author, but she's writing about um, Jewish interwar Warsaw, and there's some amazing discussions, or if the tango takes place, it, it takes a really important role in terms of um, the character development and the relationship between several characters. Um, and it does, it, it is in a, and the, the time that the, when these characters actually do start tangoing, it is a prelude to, um, to sexual intimacy. Um, so that also brings in what, uh, what Naomi was, was saying just now. Uh, another thing I don't think maybe necessarily um, got addressed there is that another aspect of the dancing is that it's um, that it's public and that often often sex isn't as public. It doesn't involve the spectatorship in in the same way. Um, and you see this. Um, I mean, one of the classic examples is in uh, Pride and Prejudice, where Mrs. Bennett, who is very concerned about the um, the financial security of the women in her family, is very concerned about who her daughters are dancing with because the people that they're dancing with could potentially be men who will support will marry them and support them and so she's watching who they're dancing with and talking about who they're dancing with and bragging about who her daughters are dancing with and like comparing it to other um do other women young women are dancing with um because that's seen to be something that will relate to who they who they end up marrying um so a lot of it is so in this context, a lot of it is also about being seen um, and people being concerned about being embarrassed as well. In um, so um, yeah, so the, uh, but um, this is all really you know really helpful to think about. I'm also reminded of a um, so a. A, a, a popular fiction piece about that was basically an anti uh, dance lesson polemic um, that has makes a comment that the sort of woman who goes to a dance uh, to a dance lesson is the sort of woman who's likely to celebrate um, a bris shortly after she gets married. So the implication is that women who are dancing are also likely to be um, to be sleeping with their dance partners and then have to and then have children. Um, less than nine months after they get married. Well, this didn't stop dancing being popular in the Jewish world. Let me move to the next question, which I'll uh, 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 to pose again to Naomi, which is how did this process differ in German speaking Europe, Eastern Europe, North America? We've already addressed this, but I don't wonder if you have any further observations you'd like to make on this question. Well, maybe I'll just say that one of the things that's so beautiful about Sonia's book that I love so much is that it really, it's not just that the dancings are so particular, it's where people dance and what kinds of spaces in which they dance. Um, and some of these dances are, um, so it's, yes, it's Eastern Europe and it's Germany and it's the United States, but it's also dance halls, which I, think are mostly, if I remember correctly, mostly the United States, right? Um, and uh, taverns, which I think are Eastern Europe and Germany, and bowls, which tend to be, let's say, high class Germany. So it's interesting to think about whether there's a correlation, I mean, if it's okay, if I can just throw another question at you, whether there's a correlation between the types of, well, well two questions, if you'll allow me. Um, whether there's a correlation between the type of space and the type of genre, like do it, it does seem like a lot of this, the material that you look at is what you call middle brow um, literature. And some of it is kind of uh, modernist, right? So the modernist, and I think the modernist genre might correlate with the masquerade ball, right? And Sacher Masa. Um, and 
So the masquerade ball lends itself to the dreamlike and the and social realism lends itself to maybe the tavern or the dance hall. I'm curious to know whether you found any correlations between spaces and generic moves. And if I could just ask one more thing, um, I was so interested by this kind of flourishing of the Purim Bowl, which seems to have been high and, and low um, and seems to have crossed continents, right? So Emma Goldman, I mean, I love to know, you know, she went, I don't know if it was a Purim Bowl. And then you hear about the Yom Kippur Bowls, um, the Anarchist Bowls. So I'm actually really curious. So, so those seem like hybrid phenomena. So um, a Purim ball is both a masquerade ball, which I think maybe comes from Italy. I don't, I, I don't remember if you said where it comes from, but, you know, it very nicely maps on to Purim. But does a Purim ball, other than the invitation to this Purim ball, in what way does it... Um, differ from a masquerade ball? Are the costumes different? I mean, I know that you describe a kind of high modernist Purim ball, but is there something about um, the ball, let's say, as representative versus, or, or even in reality that combines a kind of attention to Jewish tradition that makes it a different kind of masquerade ball? Um, and have different tensions, perhaps. I mean, I think you said there were non-Jews at Purim balls who occasionally went. Anyway, I'm sorry if that was a big mess. Of a yeah, no, I'd, I'd also like just to add to that, just to, to pure simple question: when, were the, when was the first Purim ball? Uh, because obviously this is not a part of the traditional Purim celebrations. But before I ask Sonia to reply, I'll ask. Sunny, if, if there's anything you want to add to this particular question or any to the, any contribution you'd like to make here. Yeah, well, one question I, I would have, and it's a, a question of curiosity, is um, I, I was very taken in, in Sonia, your narration and your movement from the ball space to the tavern space to the American dance hall space, um, that the dance hall was necessarily, and I'm just going to use you know a, a, a motivated term here, uncouth. Right? It was a space of immigrants who were Americanizing, but doing so in a body, um, potentially inter-ethnic space that was late at night after the work. It was inexpensive. Um, it was not at all uh, endeavoring to, to be a ball. Um, and I, I was wondering if in your corpus you came across, um, you know, what about high German Jewish society in New York City? Um, do the, are, is that, a literary trope that emerges in any way, or is it scripted that in America dance is lowbrow, um, and in Germany it's you know it's 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 a middlebrow genre um, that discusses highbrow culture. Do any of the cultural class lines get get crossed? There are a lot of questions there, so Sonia, it's up to you. So thank you. Um, I'm now wishing that I had done more work on the history of the Purim ball, and that might be something that I should do in, um, in the future, maybe give it maybe in preparation to give some sort of public talk uh, before Purim. <laughs> I will say a few things um, that I think I've found more um, discussions of Purim balls in German literature than in Yiddish literature. So uh, um, as Naomi mentioned, Sakhar Masak writes about Purim balls. Um, there's a, there is a um, there is a Yiddish language Purim ball de, uh, description in um, in Isaac Besheva Singer's uh, The Family Muscat, which is yes. set in Warsaw um, in the 1930s. And I get the sense that at Purim balls, um, so a difference from masquerade balls, which are not necessarily Jewish, is that with Purim balls, you often get other sorts of activities. You might have a Megillah reading. There might be some sort of co a costume competition. Um, but otherwise, there might be some of the same general uh, topsy turviness that's uh, that's going on. Um, I have I haven't seen so much about Jewish uh, non Jewish guests being specifically invited to um, to Purim balls, although there are examples of non Jews at Purim balls in some of these literary texts in um, an interesting thing with uh, regarding Sonny's question about the um, about the United States, 
uh, one of the main texts that I that I write about in terms of thinking about dance hall culture is um, Abraham Kahan's novella Yekel, A Tale of the New York Ghetto. And there is one um, one moment where a woman who does go to dance halls and who is a a new immigrant, um, so not an especially high um, le level class wise um, or financially, um, but she's all dressed up and she um, she pays a visit to another woman who imagines she's going to a ball. Um, so there's some awareness of balls, even if that isn't something that these um, that these working class immigrant Jews would necessarily um, encounter as much. I haven't. Um, I haven't seen so much about elite German Jewish balls in literature, but I'm looking for them. Um, so for instance, I'm in the midst of reading Our Crowd, which is um, sort of panoramic novel, historical account of elite German Jews in New York. Um, and I was, and they did have balls. Um, the descriptions so far have not been extremely um, lengthy, although there was, I think, um, I think maybe uh, Joseph Seligman, I'm not sure, but one of these um, wealthy German Jewish uh, bankers actually danced, I believe, with uh, Mrs. Grant at Ulysses Grant's um, inauguration ball. So, um, so this is an example of the, the way in which there were these more elite German Jewish balls in the United States, but I haven't found as much about it in literature per se. There is... Um, yeah, so I haven't found as much of it in the literature, at least so far, but it's something that I might want to continue looking for. And unfortunately, um, now that the book's been published, I keep finding more really interesting dance references. Well, you have to do a second edition. <laughs> uh, one thing, yeah, one okay. point I would make, which I think is rather obvious, Purim as a whole is rather der clearly derived from Carnival. European carnival. And one of the features of carnival was, of course, balls which accompanied it. So this is an example of cross-fertilization, or at least of the impact of the way in which certain uh, events were celebrated in the Christian world, which were then uh, in, imitated within the uh, Jewish world. Uh, everything turned up topsy-turvy, etc., etc., uh, back to the Saturnalia in a way, but uh, uh, the carnival is a Christianized version of Saturnalia. This leads me to the next question, which is really, in the first instance, it was sunny. Uh, I mean, and this we've also talked about a little bit already. What sort of dances are we talking about? What's the role of folk dancers, uh, both uh, East European, such as the Karachod or the Kazatska, or the Zionist variations of these, such as the Hora? Uh, and in this context, uh, there's a question of when did uh, European type folk dancing, Scottish dancing, for instance, uh, become uh, something which uh, was part of the ball scene? When did uh, group dances of that sort become transformed into uh, modern dancing above all the waltz and how is this reflected in the Jewish world so uh, Sunny I'll let you start on this question sure thanks and, and I'm 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 eager to hear from Sonia's expertise um one the the focus of this book is on what I would uh, what I would have called highbrow dancing right the waltzes the the quadrilles, the even the pas de spagna, these are coordinated dancing. And I think what's um, so effective in, in Sonia's close reading is within the context of a scripted dance, you show when um, a social encounter sort of transgresses those rules of um, performance, or even when maintaining, when even performing the quadrille, something about an eye contact, you know, or the brush of a hand changes the experience such that within this scripted moment, there is um, a tension that emerges. And I think um, thinking with uh, Anthony's question, I, I'm wondering how this works in, in mixed circle dancing. Um, you know, you gesture towards Zionist folk dancing. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I'm, you know, I finished the book and my mind immediately went to, um, you know, a mixed sex, Hora at a at a wedding in 2022, which is 
okay, on the one level, kind of scripted, but everyone's stepping on each other, you know, it's rowdier, there's jostling, it's like a very physical encounter. And I, and I'm wondering how, um, you know, based on your own readings of these fraught spaces, these metaphors of acculturation, what is what's the social work or the the social tensions that are being worked out in some of these mixed sex circle dancing zionist american or otherwise um or to to phrase the question a differently um what new questions do you feel that your research helps us pose about these other forms of mixed sex non-partner dancing Hello, Naomi, do you want to just say, add yeah, I, yeah, maybe I'll just jump on that because I had a, my thoughts went in the same direction. So um, thank you, Sonny. I mean, I, that's so interesting. I, I would also say not just mixed sex circle dancing, but also same sex circle dancing. What, what I think is so interesting is that the modern, uh, the move to the waltz, the quadrille, I can't believe I remember all these names of dances, which I don't know anything about, so thank you, that all of these have, I would say, almost passed into history. Um, we're at a period in which I think very, unless you're doing ballroom dancing or in a very specific space, maybe you'll tell us what those spaces are. We're not doing that kind of dance anymore. But even if you're a pretty secular do which I am. Um, I'm still doing lots. Of, I mean, not lots, but I'm still regularly doing circle dancing in Jewish spaces. Um, so I'm, you know, I just went to someone's 70th birthday, and you know, even a 70th birthday, we were doing circle dances. It was actually a, a dance teacher. This was in Berkeley, and it was Eleanor Shapiro, which some of you might know. She's an important person in in Jewish culture. So. Um, Circle dancing is alive and well at Jewish weddings, um, sometimes mixed, sometimes not. I'm wondering also about the clear erotics of, um, of religious dancing and how that shows itself up. And I'm thinking of, you know, the great modernist writer, Hebrew writer, Shai Agnon, one of his best known stories, Agadata Sofer. I'm trying to remember, I don't, I'm not sure you talk about a tale of the scribe where a uh, in the middle of a, a, a Simchat Torah hakafot, so men's dancing with the Torah, a little girl suddenly kind of um, jumps into the dance. So the circle dance is is alive and well not only in post waltz Jewish culture, but also in let's say modernist and contemporary Jewish culture. And some of this must have something to do with the we're now past the kind of heteronormativity and we're also in a post-secular moment. So anyway, I'm curious uh, what, what you think of all that. And I think Sonny and I are kind of, and, and Anthony have, have similar kinds of no. questions about that. I just add one thing about, are we in the post waltz era? Both uh, Sonia and I live in the UK. One of the most popular programs on UK tele on English television is a program called Come Dancing, which is a competition essentially in in ballroom dancing uh, of a very high level, and a lot of celebrities participate in it. Yes, but, uh, but that's a spectator sport for most people. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. I suppose you're right. It is a spectator sport, but but the fact is that people do. I mean, are inspired by to take part in such events. But anyway, I don't, I'll leave this to, this is for Sonia to respond to now. I mean, as somebody who's enjoyed uh, several Viennese balls, I'm not sure that um, every, I mean, I, I'm not sure that it's necessarily completely a post wall society, but certainly um, when I think about American culture and American Jewish culture, there's not the same um, assumption that as in the period that I'm discussing, that if you want to, you know, if you want to go and be an educated person and be cultured and uh, meet a partner and spend time with um, with other young people that you're going to be dancing. Like now there's many, many other options. Um, one of the things that I think about when I think about circle dances as opposed to these more scripted dances as, uh, as Sunny described them is that they don't necessarily require the same level of um, 
of training or education. And like when I think about these like circle dances, so much of it is about the sense of being in a community and being pulled along with a community. Um, sometimes when it's written, it's almost as if this like the circle, this like energy of people um, is is so powerful that it's carrying people away that it that it gets somewhat wild. Um, there's a short story by Frottlestock that I write more about in an article than in this book, but it's a short story called A Dance that was written in Yiddish, and it's describing a wedding, um, a Jewish wedding in the Lower East Side in New York in the early 20th century. And there's just like the sense of, um, of pandemonium as this, um, as this dancing is going on and it's carrying all these people who are dancing into thinking about um, their past lives, about ways in which um, maybe, you know, misfortunes that they've experienced um, don't really exist anymore. If there's a wealthy person who has lost his money, that it's almost as in this like festive environment um, of this wedding and with this dancing, it doesn't really exist anymore. Um, so there's a sense that the circle has this like powerful pulsating energy um, that that's quite um, that can be quite compelling. Um, certainly in my own uh, time as a dance leader, we um, we have dance uh, like workshops for dance leaders. We talk about how to like try and um, keep keep control of the circle, not in the sense of um, trying to like dictate what people are doing too much because I think there's this really appealing anarchy um, in certain ways in this uh, sort of Jewish dancing uh, or Yiddish dancing, but um, but to sort of make sure that people aren't like you know pull too fast, too hard, so that it's unpleasant for people um, because there is this sort of sense where you are being um, drawn along with a crowd that you have this different sort of energy than if you are doing a square dance or a couple's dance. I'll just add one response to one aspect of this. Uh, Julian Tuvim, the Polish Jewish poet's perhaps greatest work is a, po is a long poem called The Ball at the Opera, which describes in the pre-war, just before the outbreak of the Second World War, the whole of corrupt Jewish, the whole of corrupt Warsaw going to a ball at the opera uh, people from Germany, uh, Nazis, uh, fascists of all sorts, uh, a, a ball which ends with the apocalypse. It's a, taken from the apocalypse of St. John. It ends with the world being destroyed. I could say more about this, but we don't have enough time. We are gradually coming to the end of this discussion. I hope we have a large audience out there. It's difficult to tell because they're on YouTube. But so far, we haven't had any questions. But there are two questions with which I'd like to conclude the discussion. And these both relate to the use of literary examples and to the link with the non-Jewish world. The first one is, I was very struck by your quotation from Carl Emil Franzose's book, uh, Judith Trachtenberg, in which the heroine commits suicide after being victimized by an anti-Semitic male dance partner at a ball. How much of this mixed sex dancing involved meetings of this sort? You talked about this in your presentation, but I, perhaps I'll ask Sunny first to comment on this and then uh, Naomi and your reactions. So Sunny. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, I think with, with Sonia's work time and time again, we are, especially in the European, uh, in the works of European literature, which is interesting to think about and compare in contrast to the American, where mixed dance, dance, the scenes of mixed sex dancing are also dancing of Jew with Christian, um, because here non-Jew is primarily Christian, um, and I and I think um, uh, one thing that Sonia's work points us to is that you know you use um, Clifford Geert's ideas of deep play to try to understand um, uh, these scenes. And I was just rereading Jeff Israel's book on um, living with hate in American politics and religion, which is a, a title that belies the content, which is about American, um, American Jewish American writing um, and what he calls rough play. So how can certain forms of aggressive humor, um, particularly by Jews about non-Jews, um, how can that allow for not catharsis, but of an ability to sit with the tension and to really, um, really to feel uncomfortable? And, and for 
for Jeff Israel, that's a mode of, of civic practice, like the, the ability to recognize discomfort and not allow it to abate. Um, and I was thinking about this when reading about the Jewish, non-Jewish encounters in your work, um, because a, a function of Middlebrow literature is that there has to be a resolution, right? Judith Trachtenberg has to either convert or die. Um, and it seems that in that in that particular novel, the agency is enacted through the taking of her own life. Um, it seems to be the, the only option that the that the 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 um, the writer allows for her, and and suicide is something that appears time and time again in your work. Um, and what I'm I'm trying to to narrate in my in my longer statement here is that. Um, within the context of Sonia's work, within these Jewish, non-Jewish encounters, the Jew is slated to lose. Um, and one thing that feels interesting to me about the possibility of moving this into American context, maybe without wanting to be you know, optimistic or even thinking about contemporary European Jewish writing, I'd be interested to know, um, is that there are different alternative endings that are, that are that are possible, um, that are desired, instead of what seems to be, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, that the scene of mixed, mixed sex dancing will lead to pain. Um, and the pain will primarily be on the part of the Jewish subject, if that's a fair Yes, Natalie, do you want to add something to this? Yeah, so you cut out for a second, are we, uh, did it, just at the moment that you were phrasing your question, it's about the question of dance as a, as a interaction between Jews and non-Jews. Yes, yes. So I I think that the what's so interesting about looking at this through dance is um, and if you can think about all the other ways of looking at it. Um, so one of them would be legislation and the kinds of things that scholars of emancipation looked at. Right. So when did Jews get this right or that right? And how were these rights limited? Um, and then let's say a, a different kind of scholarship is around, did Jews convert? Did Jews intermarry? A kind of radical assimilation. What's so interesting about the dance space is that it's like, yes, you could have the, um, the intention, the philosophical or political intention to integrate. But what happens when you're actually at a ball? Um, and I'm thinking about that scene in Maimon where he talks about, you know, women are great, but not for philosophy. Um, like, and they're probably thinking, and Jews are great for philosophy, but not as dance partners. So what, what you, this is such an interesting middle space about the body and about who you might want to flirt with, but not necessarily men. Harry, um, all these things that somehow, let's say, fall through the cracks of the ways in which this question of, I'm thinking of Jacob Katz's landmark um, out of the ghetto, where he has this whole, like, what are the spaces? The Masonic Temple is one very early space in which Jews and Christians um, mix. And yet, they're not holding hands. They're not putting on, you know, it's, it's men. It's basically Jewish men. So discovering if you if we're going to get any closer to a kind of nuance question of that border between Jews and Christians in Europe, in the United States, et cetera, then this is such an interesting place, um, you know, because it, it, it gets at a kind of fine grain um, of uh, somewhere between the statistics around conversion and intermarriage and you know, the edicts of emancipation. So um, I don't know, I'm just saying, you got a great answer, Sonia, and it's a very complicated answer and it takes a book. And I hope, by the way, your next book is about circle dancing. <laughs> Sonia, do you want to respond? So thank you so much. Um, these are both such wonderful perspectives on the book. Um, I will say, I, I guess what, the one thing that I was going to add to that, because I agree with everything that you're saying, is um, one interesting shift that I noticed in terms of late 20th century um, popular culture and literature, also to a certain extent in um, in film or television, is that this um, this Jewish non non Jewish encounter that inevitably ends up with pain for the Jews gets shifted, and that actually um, for various reasons 
um, which I speculate a bit on in the epilogue, uh, but could, I mean, it's something that could be explored further. This, it no longer becomes, um, it's no longer seen as impossible in the same way. You don't have these uh, pre-World War II tendentious fiction like um, Carla Mille-Francois's Judith Trachtenberg, where they're showing the impossible situation for Jews that want to be part of European society, and they're showing the Jewish pain to try and change people's minds. Um, in these late 20th, early 20th century texts, like, so for instance, the film Dirty Dancing, which ends with an, an unequivocally happy end. Um, and so you imagine that actually when the music stops for the dance, that it ends, that actually there might be some sort of future possible, even though before the dancing started, it wasn't clear how that, that future could work, that some of these, um, some of these concerns, some of these social limitations um, and boundaries that are seen as completely unworkable in these pre-war texts um, in the late in get from like the 80s to to the present day you you get more uh, more of a sense that somehow they're just not they're not impossible obstacles and it's not necessarily explained why except um, there's one um, Australian murder mystery um, um, raisins and almonds from the Phryne Fisher uh, murder mystery series, and um, her relationship with a non-Jewish man is seen as I mean, she even gets the support of his mother because, as she as this um, non-Jewish detective Phryne Fisher, the Honorable Phryne Fisher explains to the mother of this Jewish man that she's um, involved with on a short-term basis. She only wants to borrow him, not marry him, and then he can marry. Um, a woman that his mother would approve of more. Um, so that's that's the way that they get around it in that particular novel, which is utterly delightful and starts out with a foxtrot competition at a Jewish social club. Well, I think we gradually have to bring this very stimulating discussion to an end. I'm afraid that we didn't have any questions, but I'm happy to tell you that we had more than 50 viewers, and I hope that they learned, as we all have, from this very stimulating discussion. In closing, I'd like to ask you, uh, Sonia, to sum up uh, what you think you've achieved with this book. And in particular, uh, since the book is heavily dependent on literary examples, what problems you faced in using literary examples? So thank you. Um, so one of, I mean, one of the big achievements, I think, of this book is that it's the first book to take the it to use literary dance studies methodologies in a Jewish uh, in a Jewish studies context. Um, so I mentioned before that there hasn't really been focus on European Jewish dance um, as a focus of an entire book as opposed to an individual chapter or something like that. Um, but also the analysis of dance scenes in literature is something that hasn't been approached in terms of thinking about Jews. There might Maybe there'll be there, maybe there's a discussion of works like Daniel Deronda that have dance scenes because like literary dance studies um, has been mostly taking or it, it's been largely uh, centered on the study of 19th century British literature, which makes sense when you think of Jane Austen novels, for instance. Um, but I find that it's really um, helpful to think about the role of dance um, and hopefully you agree after hearing all this, the role of dance in mediating the experience of a minority group that has aspirations of participating in European culture, including European dance culture. Um, so that's so that's a big thing that I'm trying to do. But also um, another thing is to show the way that dance scenes in literature can be used to help find information about the practices of Jewish communities. Um, and that's been very challenging at times because you don't necessarily have the same sort of information that you would have in an ethnographic report. Um, a lot of times these dance scenes show the different um, the different emotional relationships between the characters or how people are feeling as they're dancing, or um, it takes place at a pivotal point in a plot. And these are all things you can analyze. But 
Sometimes they might say what the dance is, sometimes not. Sometimes it will just say they're dancing. Maybe they assume readers would know. Sometimes um, you know what sort of steps or mov movements are going on. And sometimes it's much more vague. Um, there's also sometimes dances that are mentioned where there isn't that much uh, information available. Um, if it's a Jewish uh, a Jewish folk dance that has that it hasn't been part of the um, the Klevismer and Yiddish culture revival. Um, I also another thing that that I was quite proud of. I'm not sure how um, widespread the notice would be for this. Is that when I was researching some of the East European dances, um, like the Kamarinskaya. Um, which is this like competitive Russian male dance? I was having, a, I was really struggling to find information written about these dances in English. Um, in the case of the Kamarinskaya, um, my um, friend, a mentor, klezmer revivalist Michael Alpert, fortunately happened to have a Soviet um, Belarusian ethnographic encyclopedia um, in his home. And he was kind enough to go through it and like look at the information there and then help me figure out what was going on so that I would be able to better analyze a scene in a Yiddish novella that was written in the United States. Um, so, um, so that was a challenge trying to just find the dance scenes themselves since often people weren't necessarily paying attention to them if they were writing literary histories, writing about um, Jewish dance. So um, I became very good at accosting senior scholars at, at conferences and asking them if they could tell me about dance scenes they had encountered. Um, I, um, Jonathan Hess, um, who unfortunately um, has since passed away, was extremely generous. He actually like went through his notes after the conference and sent me a list that was extremely helpful um, and uh, you know, other scholars as well. And I also got good at predicting what types of plot choices or styles of literature or which writers were likely to mention dance. And then I would read those texts and often find it. Um, we've also, I mean, also there's been, we've had a lot of increased aids in terms of things like the OCR search um, for the Yiddish Book Center, um, some of the, the searching capabilities of, um, of compact memory, which is is a database of German language, Jewish newspapers. Um, and so like those, those sorts of digital tools have also made things easier. Um, but a lot of it is about trying to make sense of what's written there and see how it fits in with other historical and ethnographic information. Well, I think you've done a remarkable job in doing that. And I very much advise all of our audience to buy and uh, uh, borrow by borrow or buy and read this important book, which uh, Sunny is describing. I'd like to thank very much um, Sonia for presenting her book this evening. It's been a very stimulating presentation. And I'd like to also to thank the two discussants, uh, Naomi Zeidman and Sunny Yudkov, uh, both of whom have uh, given us a very interesting way of looking, very interesting ways of looking at this book. I'm also happy to say that everything from a technical point of view went like clockwork, which isn't always the case. So in conclusion, I'd also like to thank those who have contributed to facilitating the technical side of this discussion. Uh, Lukas Czeslak, Jan Wozniakowski, Jacek Flux, Magdalena Lasotska, uh, and those who are involved behind the scenes like Iveta Rocek, Alexandra of, of Czarczyk, and uh, Susanna uh, 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 Rosen Spindler. Um, in conclusion, again, I'd like to thank all of you who participated. This has been a very stimulating discussion, and I hope that in the next year we'll have more such stimulating discussions. And now we can all go out and dance, or not, as the case may be. Well, thank you. And it's good. perfect. It's somewhat a mixed dance, and it's somewhat a circle dance in this Zoom room. Yes, quite so, quite so. <laughs> Bye, Mazel Tov on your beautiful book, Sonia. Yes, congratulations again. Congrats, Sonia. I'm looking forward to talking more. So See you all at the AJS. Yes. Bye, Nomi. Bye, Anthony. Nice to meet you. Bye.